All right, it's good to see everybody on here tonight. And uh, tonight uh, we're gonna be talking about forest health, uh, woodland health, and we've got Dr. Ellen Crocker with the University of Kentucky uh, uh, Department of Forestry. And uh, she's gonna be talking a little bit about woodland health. And uh, uh, she's, she's got knowledge in, in a little bit of everything, mushrooms, and I think you may even cover a little bit of mast uh, production for this year, but uh, uh, Ellen, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you and let you get started on here, but it's uh, good to see everybody this evening. And uh, without further ado, Dr. Ellen Crawford. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for inviting me today. Uh, I was saying earlier, I wish I could join you all in person, but really appreciate the opportunity uh, to be there uh, virtually. And, you know, um, I can start this out by saying, I've got a presentation for you all, um, but if you have you know, particular questions, uh, that you're really interested in, um, let me know, put them in the chat, um, and I'll make sure to address those as well, or we can address them at the end. Um, so today, my plan was to give kind of a, a big picture update of what's going on with woodland health in our region. And, uh, you know, woodland health or forest health, I'm going to use them interchangeably, basically the same thing. Um, how well are the trees in your woodland doing? is a really tricky subject and it's very subjective in a lot of ways because how well they're doing depends on what you want them to be doing. Uh, so if you've got particular questions, please raise those. Um, I'm gonna go through kind of a laundry list of a lot of different uh, terrible things that are happening in our woodlands. <laughs> so the different insects, uh, diseases, invasive plants, um, extreme weather issues we've been having that are uh, in how they're affecting trees. But I kind of, um, th that it's a doom and gloom presentation in some ways because uh, you hear what I'm talking about and it's like, oh, how will all our trees ever survive? Um, and I just wanna start this out by saying, I think you know, compared to other parts of the country, other parts of the world, um, we're really fortunate in our region. We have a land that wants to grow trees and uh, we grow trees really well. And we have an incredible diversity of different tree species. Um, you know, you visit some parts of the country and they have maybe a handful of different major species. We have, you know, well over a hundred, 120 different native tree species. Uh, so when we talk about things like these invasive threats that are wiping out species, um, I just like to go back to that as a, as a, the, you know, the hope that's there. And, you know, I don't, I don't feel the doom and gloom of it. I feel the optimism of, you know, just how uh, resilient our woodlands are and what a strength it is to our region. Uh, because we've got diversity, we've got water, we have all of these things that trees need. Um, and I think that's going to be an incredible asset to us going forward. Um, so I just wanted to preface with that, you know, uh, despite the fact that I'm going to be talking about some pretty scary things, um, I think overall the picture is pretty bright. Um, so let me go ahead and share my screen and I will share this presentation with you all and uh, go ahead and do this. So hopefully you should be able to see me, uh, see the presentation, and if you can't, uh, just uh, shoot me a chat and I will change something up and um, I'll try to pause periodically if you've got chats or anything like that just let me know and if you've got any questions I'm happy to stop uh, I uh, do have the gift of gab and I will continue on as long as someone lets me uh, but I'll try to wrap this up in a reasonable amount of time so uh, kind of giving an overview uh, what are the threats to the health of our forests and woodlands um, to the trees that we care so much about uh, you know, there are a lot of different things that are out there, and I'm going to kind of lump them up into a few sections. So the really major forest health issues that are out there are invasive insects, diseases, and plants. And the reason for that is that these invasive species, they're, they're not from here, they're from somewhere else. And our trees, our woodlands really don't have defenses to them. Uh, so when we're talking about invasive insects and diseases, the big problem is that they are killing trees and not just any trees, but healthy trees. Um, so they can really change woodlands in that way. When we're talking about invasive plants, for the most part, it's a little different. You know, they might not be killing individual trees, but they can really change our woodlands 
uh, by changing the patterns of which plants are successful, which plants are regenerating, which ones are dominating. So uh, instead of seeing, you know, the species that you want to be seeing are native big shade dominant trees, and then maybe uh, the shrubs and the wildflowers um, that you want that support timber, that support wildlife, um, what you're seeing are a lot of invasive species that just don't fill that niche. Uh, so those, in my mind, are the kind of major, most major uh, issues for our woodlands. Um, now, another thing I wanted to, to point to your attention are some kind of invasives that maybe aren't here yet, but are on the horizon. So if we talk about the invasives that are here right now, it's going to be emerald ash borer, hemlock lily adelgid, uh, laurel will, invasive plants. And then historically, we've got this incredible legacy of uh, chestnut blight and loss of American chestnut. I mean, it's really hard to overstate just how big the loss of chestnut is um, for our woodlands in general, because I really think our woodlands are still coping with the absence of this species that's just so central. Um, so there's lots of different ones that are currently here, but then we've got a lot of invasives nearby uh, that I, I hope don't arrive. Um, but I'm just gonna brief, uh, briefly mention some of these to put them on your radar so you can be more aware of them if you see something like that. And then I want to mention some other issues. So this is where I'm going to talk about a few native issues that tend to pop up each year, um, insects, diseases that maybe look really bad but are less likely to um, really hurt our woodlands because these are natives. Our trees are familiar with them, they've dealt with them for many years, um, as well as our extreme weather. Now we've had some super strange weather these past few years um, and Yes, our trees are adapted to these areas, but um, uh, the weather's really throwing them, you know, some, some uh, unusual stuff. Uh, so I think we're likely to see some impact from that. Uh, so that's my plan. Feel free to stop me or ask any other questions you might have. So our current invasives. Emerald ash borer tops my list kind of in general. Uh, and that's because it's completely wiping out ash trees, which prior to the arrival of emerald ash borer were about 4% of the species overall in the state. Now it's very patchy, so you might not have any ash trees. And I know in your area, there's a lot less ash than there is in some other parts of the state. Um, but that doesn't mean that you couldn't have a pocket of them on your property. You can have um, more than, than the average in your area. So I'm gonna mention that, uh, kind of uh, gloss over some things. Uh, just because I know that it's it's likely to be less, less central of a driver for you all than it is in, say, the northern part of the state, where they might have had 25, 30, 35 percent of their trees being ash. Um, so here you've got a little diagram of what's going on with the emerald ash borer. It's a small uh, green metallic beetle uh, native to Asia, and um, what's really happening when it comes in is that its larvae, uh, the kind of uh, immature form form of that beetle uh, are chewing and eating just under the bark of the tree in the vascular system. And that's the part of the tree that basically does everything. It's moving around water, it's moving around sugars and nutrients, and if that system is compromised, the tree dies. Uh, so it's basically like strangling the, the tree when you've got a vascular system that's impacted. So you've got these little larvae that are tunneling everywhere, cutting off circulation, strangling that tree, and then you get dead trees. So what are some signs of the emerald ash borer? And I'm saying e EAB here for short, just because emerald ash borer is a long, long title to type each time. Um, I look for dead branches, a thinning crown, uh, maybe some other signs being these D-shaped holes in the tree, right on the trunk. And that's where the larvae have been in there. They've been tunneling around. You can see in this photo what it looks like if you chip off the bark, what their tunneling looks like. Um, people call that serpentine because it's so squiggly. Uh, but by the time you see these kinds of things, uh, really what's happening is that tree has a lot of larvae inside of it, and they're probably already causing some pretty extensive damage, which is one of the problems with the emerald ash borer and other things, and that by the time you notice there's something wrong, it's pretty far along. It can be hard to save your tree. Um, so another thing to look for would be, and I think a lot of uh, areas, if you do have ash in your area, you're probably seeing some of this right now, uh, the bark's flaking off. Uh, it might be wildlife doing that, trying to get at those larvae. Uh, woodpeckers really like to eat those larvae, um, uh, the emerald ash borer larvae. If only they were a little bit more effective, um, maybe we could control it. And who knows, maybe long term that'll be part of the control of emerald ash borer, uh, but they're not quite good enough to stop it from killing your trees. 
Um, so in this picture, you can just see where they've flaked off a lot of bark and bark has come off um, from wildlife and on its own uh, as things try to get the, those beetle larvae. So, uh, and my apologies to any of you who are in Virginia, I just have the Kentucky version of this. Um, but here's kind of where we are right now with emerald ash borer in the state. And um, what I really like, you know, it's, it's filling in the gaps, it's moving in Western Kentucky, but I really like this map. And both of these maps are from the Kentucky Division of Forestry. Um, so this map right here shows you not where it is, but where it's killing ash trees. So um, the longer it is in a location, the kind of higher the percentage of ash that are gonna be dead. Um, so this shows you uh, based on the Kentucky Division of Forestry flying airplanes over these areas, um, how frequent is ash death due to the emerald ash borer? Um, so you can see in your area, uh, depending on where you are, you might have ash mortality being real common. You might have it just starting. You might have it kind of sporadic. Um, so it just depends. Uh, and I think that thinking about that is really key for thinking about what your options are and what your response can be. So what a lot of people are kind of at right now is the beetle came in, it killed all the trees, and now what? Um, so a lot of the questions I get about this are kind of in that more landscape setting because ash is such a popular tree to plant in front of your yard, on your street. Um, but, uh, you know, what we're talking about today is woodlands. And the responses to those two different settings would be real different. But in both of those cases, what we're talking about is laying the foundation for success post emerald ash borer. So we're not going to go back in time. We're not going to undo the emerald ash borer. Uh, unfortunately, it's going to uh, spread. Um, but what we can do is we can use that incredible diversity that our woodlands have. We can use the resilience of our woodlands and we can build a, a strong um, woodland post emerald ash borer. Uh, especially if you didn't have that much uh, ash in your woodlands, this, this is pretty straightforward. Um, so that's kind of the first step in my mind in assessing the damage that's been done by a mill ash borer or will be done um, is thinking about how much ash did you have. If you only had a few ash trees, then you can just kind of disregard this whole thing uh, because we have lots of different species. We have lots of species uh, that are native, that are great, um, that can take the place of ash. Um, and uh, I think that's a normal thing in our woodlands for trees to die, for there to be seedlings and saplings to fill those gaps and take their place. And we have naturally regenerating woodlands, so um, that's a real strength. Um, on the other hand, if your property or, uh, you know, is in somewhere that had a lot of ash, you might need to have a different plan for that. Um, if there was a really high percentage of ash, uh, it might need more intervention. Um, so another question I'd have is how far along is this damage? So in these pictures, you can see some wood that's been damaged on the left, uh, some firewood, uh, you know, trees that are killed by the emerald ash borer. The emerald ash borer doesn't actually impact the wood itself. It tunnels just under the bark pretty much, and the wood itself is fine um, until that tree dies and starts to decline. And once that happens really rapidly, other insects and fungi will kind of opportunistically take advantage of that stressed tree and move in and have a banquet. So in that second picture, what you can see are those tiny little holes uh, with some black staining around them. Those are ambrosia beetles. Um, they're native ambrosia beetles as well as non-native ambrosia beetles, just a whole bunch of different species. Um, and what we found is that if you're interested in logging your ash, it's really got to happen uh, before those trees are dead or really shortly afterwards, because if not, these ambrosia beetles will move in and they will really decrease the value of your uh, logs um, because they'll be riddled with lots of holes. So thinking about how far along is the damage by emerald ash borer. Similarly, if you did want to treat any of your trees, there are insecticides that can protect uh, trees from the emerald ash borer. They do have to be repeated regularly, so it's not going to last forever. Um, but those only work for trees that are still relatively healthy. And really, um, it's going to be prohibitively expensive uh, for a large woodland, unless that's a real priority for you. Um, but it could be a good option for kind of your, your tree in your front yard, a really beautiful tree that you don't want to lose. Um, so some other considerations. Uh, Consider harvest to offset the costs of timber stand improvement practices if you have a lot of ash. So again, if you don't have much ash, you probably don't need to consider this. But if you did have a lot, um, considering how to how to 
you know, set your woodland up for success. And one of the most common needs that I see in that regard is managing invasive plants because any disturbance, whether it's a harvest or an ice storm or the emerald ash borer that opens up the canopy is a perfect opportunity for invasive plants uh, to spread and to take over. So they might have just been one little plant here or there, um, but when something like that happens, uh, it really is a chance for those invasives to take off. And that's not what you want. <laughs> you know, you want those native species to be uh, taking advantage of those light conditions. Uh, so if you do have um, some disturbance uh, either coming your way, like emerald ash borer, um, or that you know is coming, like a harvest, uh, you really want to get on top of those invasive plants before that happens, so you aren't trying to play catch up afterwards. Another thing that I just want to mention, and this, you know, applies for a lot of different things, not just emerald ash borer, is dealing with hazard trees. So in this photo here, um, I've, uh, it's a woodland, and it was this winter, so um, you'll have to, that's why there's no leaves on. Uh, but you can see in this area, this is a site that had a lot of ash. And so everything that's circled here with red all has snapped basically in the past a week. Um, a tree that failed uh, in a storm that was killed by the emerald ash borer. And of course, here we have a whole other pocket of ash trees that are ready to die. Uh, so uh, not ready to die, they're dead, they're ready to fall over. And this particular shot is right next to two trails that are really frequented. Uh, so you can imagine, you know, if this is your property, somewhere you visit regularly, um, just keep in mind the risk that those hazard trees um, pose. So again, you know, consider removing those trees before they start falling apart. If you've got a lot of them and if they're somewhere that you go a lot, um, afterwards those trees are really low value. Um, the trees are going to fall apart rapidly. They're going to drop their branches rapidly. Now there is wildlife value of those snags. So not to say you need to take them all out, just if they're a potential risk, if they're somewhere where people might be, and be, be especially careful when it's windy out. And this kind of emphasizes to me the value of calling and working with a professional in some of these cases. So with that, I'm gonna wrap up the emerald ash borer. Again, we could talk for a lot more about that, um, but here's something that I bet uh, you all will be especially interested in, and that's the hemlock woolly adelgid. This is another invasive insect um, that unfortunately is just wiping out our hemlock trees. Um, in this photo, you can see kind of a whole area of hemlocks that have been killed by it. Uh, right now is the time to be looking um, because you can really clearly see uh, the signs that those insects are there uh, with these kind of tufted white uh, woolly um, area, uh, structures that they make. Uh, that, that's a clear sign that they're there. Um, you won't be able to see this all of the year. Uh, so right now is a good time to be scouting for it. And what these insects, these adelgids do, they're very tiny little insects. And uh, unlike the emerald ash borer that's you know, tunneling in the tree and cutting off the circulation of the tree, uh, what these ones are doing is they're sucking the sap uh, from the tree uh, on those needles, on the undersides of those needles. And while they're doing that, they're also injecting a toxin into the tree that causes the tree's uh, needles to dry up, um, causes death of some of those tips. Um, so both the sheer kind of them sucking all of that sap from the tree, plus the added damage done, uh, really, I mean, it's amazing just how, uh, how severe that damage can be. And it might take a little bit longer, so emerald ash borer might be able to kill the tree within just a couple of years. Hemlock woolly adult might be a slower process, uh, but nonetheless, you know, there is a lot of death due to hemlock woolly adelgid. Um, so here's a map of where hemlock woolly adelgid, in this case they're calling it HWA, is present. And you can see that for us, if you look, you know, everywhere there's hemlock pretty much, unfortunately, um, there is this hemlock woolly adelgid. Now, uh, one of the questions that I get from people is that, you know, is that still around? Because maybe there were some pockets that used to have the adelgid and don't anymore. And I would say that it's really sporadic, the death of trees. And it depends on a lot of different things, but uh, one of the kind of just anecdotally, I think that um, a few years ago when we had that polar vortex, it was really cold. It knocked back those insect populations a little bit. Um, but unfortunately, it's not going to be a permanent thing. They're going to recover. 
um, that are going to continue to be a problem into the future. So you'll have kind of sporadic pockets of tree death throughout the area. Now there are some insecticide treatment options for hemlock lily adelgid. Um, and it really kind of depends on uh, uh, the location in some ways. Um, there are also some biological control uh, trials. And, um, you know, I'm going to put this reference up here for those insecticide options. Uh, I can send you more resources if you're interested in that. Um, for the um, biological controls, that's something that's still kind of uh, being figured out. I know that um, some of the national forests are working on that, release some of those predatory beetles um, to see if they can maybe eat those adelgids and keep their populations in check. Um, and also trying to figure out long term, how do we combine these two strategies? You know, these insecticides would, would of course kill the, the um, uh, insects that you hope will keep those hemlock populations in check as well. So how do you make sure that we've got that right balance and that what we're doing long term uh, might be able to support um, some healthy hemlock trees? Another thing that I'd say is that unfortunately, hemlock lily adelgid is not the only invasive insect that's impacting hemlock. So these are a couple photos of another uh, insect elongate hemlock scale. Uh, that you can find uh, all over. And, um, you know, a little, it's not as severe as hemlock lily adelgid. Um, it does a lot of the same things and can really stress the tree over time, um, you know, in some of the same ways. So another invasive insect pest that we really don't want to see, but it's common on hemlock. Um, for both of the things I just talked about, ash and hemlock, I think that a key part of the long-term uh, formula for how we're gonna deal with those is going to be finding trees that are for some reason resistant to those invasive insects. So, you know, they have some defense, unique defense um, that's passed down genetically that makes uh, them poor hosts for those insects. Um, so maybe the larvae can't develop in them, or maybe they're really, uh, you know, uh, unpalatable. Uh, and we are looking for what are called lingering trees. So these are trees that when all of the other trees of that species, so when all of the other ash or all the other hemlocks in the area are dead, have been killed, um, these trees are still alive. Uh, we really would like to know um, if you see any of those trees and where they are so we can maybe get some seed from them and try to put them into a nursery program that would get them back out on the landscape. Because some preliminary trials um, from the US Forest Service have found that those trees are left when that happens. Um, for ash in, in particular, they seem to have genetic resistance to the emerald ash borer. So trying to see, can we find them and can we get them back out there? And uh, we've got an app called uh, treesnap.org, or treesnap. You can find out more at treesnap.org. Um, it's a free download for iPhone or Android. And if you find any trees that kind of fit that description, healthy trees when everything else is dead, um, uh, let us know and, and submit them on TreeSnap uh, so we can follow up with you. So I want to tell you about a new invasive disease to our area that uh, fortunately is impacts a lot fewer trees than either of the two I just talked about. Um, and that is laurel wilt disease of sassafras. So um, on the one hand, you know, we don't have as much sassafras across uh, the state. It's probably about 1% of the trees. Um, the downside, however, is that sassafras is a great tree. I mean, I remember learning uh, sassafras when I was a kid, um, the, the uh, you know, fork, spoon, and mitten kind of different sh leaf shapes. Um, it's a tree that's been used uh, for many centuries um, medicinally and uh, culinarily. Uh, it's, it's used to make gumbo filet and other things. Um, and I think it's just a more diversity of trees that we have in our forest that we're going to lose from invasive um, issues. So just another species to add to the list, to add to chestnut, to add to elm, to add to ash, to add to, you know, you name it, it's going to keep going. Um, so it's just kind of more of that diversity we're going to lose. So laurel wilt disease uh, in our area, the two species that it is likely to impact is sassafras and spicebush. 
So sassafras is kind of a smaller tree typically, although I've seen some huge sassafras. And the national champion sassafras is actually in Kentucky. Um, uh, but for the most part, kind of smaller trees, uh, understory trees, maybe along fence rows and other places. Uh, Spicebush is a um, shrub. Um, I think it's a really neat, uh, neat plant. And it's a popular, growing in popularity as a native alternative to some of the invasive shrubs like bush honeysuckle. Um, both of these, you know, have mass for wildlife, um, are uh, filling this unique niche, and they are both um, likely to be readily killed by this disease. So um, it's, this disease is actually a combination of a fungus that's carried by an ambrosia beetle, so a very, very tiny beetle, um, and that beetle moving it around. And um, it's native to Asia, both the fungus and the beetle. Uh, they were introduced to North America um, in you know, the first detection in 2002 along this coastal area. And you can see it's kind of moving all through this region. Um, there, the host is Red Bay Laurel, thus the name. And um, they do have some sassafras down there, but really not too much. Uh, and you can see there's been a big jump between our area and where it was previously. So probably moved here accidentally on contaminated firewood. We really don't know how it got here, um, but I think humans were definitely involved. And I think that's key for all of these invasives. You know, the less we can do to move them around, the better. So in Kentucky right now, as far as we know, it's just here in the southwestern part of the state. Um, however, uh, it's also in Tennessee, just across the border. And in Tennessee, they detected it in the eastern part of the state as well. Um, and I think that uh, for us, we have a lot of uh, trees all across the state that are potentially at risk. And unfortunately, I bet this disease has spread a lot further than we even know. Uh, last summer was the first time we found it, but it had obviously been there probably for a few years prior to our um, finding out about it. Uh, so hopefully this year we don't find it in more places, um, but we'd really like to hear from you if you have sassafras that are dying or in decline um, so we can learn more about where it is right now. Um, so what do you look for? Right now, the sign would be, it looks like falls come early. You've got early fall leaf color and sassafras has beautiful fall foliage. Um, so you've got these reds and yellows and oranges, um, really nice color, uh, eye catching. Uh, and then after that, you know, just dead sassafras, dead twigs and um, large trees. I've seen some huge, huge trees killed, uh, which is really a shame. Um, so the, that's kind of the first sign would be early fall leaf color dead trees. Um, but then if you dig under the bark, because there's a lot of other things that can kill sassafras, um, it's not uncommon to see sassafras that are kind of struggling, especially as sites change. Um, you know, they're an early, early establishing species and then as they get shaded out, um, they might get different root rots and different issues. But if you were to dig just under the bark and find this really black, super dark staining, um, you can see in this picture, it's very streaky black staining under the bark. That's not normal. That's the fungus uh, that's living in the vascular system. It's cutting off the circulation of the tree, clogging everything up. Again, that vascular system is what the trees need. Um, so the fungus is in there clogging things up and then the tree is trying to defend itself and it's clogging up its own vascular system, trying to stop that fungus. So you've got a combination of those two things killing the tree. So if you chip away at the, the bark, you can see it there. If you look just underneath it, this is kind of a cross section, you can see this dark staining right around the edge as well. Um, so it can spread from tree to tree by these very, very tiny red bay ambrosia beetles. Um, when I say tiny, I mean super tiny. Uh, so here's a piece of wood that I'm holding. You can see that black staining. What might be less evident is these tiny, tiny little dots. Um, and I don't know about you, and uh, for me, those are really tough to see. And uh, maybe if you're an entomologist and you're super, super honed to finding those tiny little uh, ho holes, you'd see them. Um, but I think it's really easy to overlook these. 
uh, as well as the potential toothpicks, which are signs of those uh, ambrosia beetles um, tunneling and pushing out that kind of sawdust uh, toothpick um, waste afterwards. Um, really easy to miss either of these. And so I would say if you see signs of sassafras dying, it's worth looking at further. And um, in addition, when we're thinking about, again, not moving it any faster than it's going to move naturally, uh, don't, not, don't move around material, even if it looks okay. Um, I'd think twice about it because these beetles are really small, really hard to see them. And all you need is one beetle carrying, you know, one little bit of that fungus to kill a tree. So uh, really minimizing that. Um, and lots of other things can cause similar issues in sassafras. So just because you see some dead trees might not uh, mean that you have laurel wilt. Um, I just put a few photos up here of things that aren't uh, laurel wilt, aren't those ambrosia beetles, uh, the red bay ambrosia beetles, but different ambrosia beetles on stress trees. Um, and another thing I want to say before moving on from this one is the name laurel wilt. I've had many people ask me, okay, does this mean it's going to affect mountain laurel? It does not. Mountain laurel is not at risk, um, kind of a total different uh, group of uh, plants that it's going to impact. Fortunately, just spice bush and sassafras in our area, not mountain laurel. So with that, I want to kind of transition over to another group of invasives that we already have here, uh, invasive plants. And we could talk invasive plants all night. Um, there are so many different invasive plants um, and new ones are constantly arriving. And so but I'm just going to mention what are some of the common invasive plants uh, in our area and then a few that um, we may have a little bit of but I think we're likely to see a lot more of. So I want to put them on your radar not because you need one more thing to worry about because you know goodness knows we have enough of that but the earlier that you can catch some of these invasive plants um, and uh, eradicate them locally the better the chance that you won't have to deal with them as much in the future. So I just want to put them on your, kind of give you a mental image of them. Uh, so for invasive plants, we have all sorts of different types of invasive plants. We have trees like princess tree, tree of heaven, mimosa. Um, and how do these impact our woodlands? You know, they're taking the place of other trees that we want to be seeing. So our native tree species that are going to grow into those um, large dominant trees. Um, instead, we've got kind of invasive plants clogging things up, taking their space, um, reproducing really, really rapidly and uh, colonizing really rapidly, but not doing the things that we want in our woodlands, either from a wildlife, a, a biodiversity, or a timber perspective. Um, and not on this list, but one that I've been seeing a lot more of is calorie pear. Um, that one is really taking off a Bradford or calorie pear. Um, an increasing problem. Shrubs, uh, how are they a problem? Well, they're in the understory. Again, they're kind of in that space that what you really want to be seeing are native species. You want to see native shrubs, of course, but you also want to see regeneration. You want to see those tree saplings that are ready to take the place of the dominant trees if there is some kind of disturbance. They're ready to shoot up and uh, kind of take advantage of that. Um, but they can't do that if it's just a dense sea of multiflora rose or autumn olive or bush honeysuckle. Um, so they're impacting our woodlands in that way. And I see a lot of that in the central Kentucky area with bush honeysuckle and emerald ash borer. Uh, but the same thing happens in different contexts. Uh, vines, uh, what are they doing? They are carpeting areas, preventing trees from establishing there. They might even grow up and over trees, especially kind of smaller trees that are just getting established, um, cover them and, and kill them in that way. Um, for the most part, vines are not strangling trees or directly impacting them, but they are impacting their access to light and other resources that they need. There are a couple exceptions to that, um, but just kind of in general. Uh, so you have kudzu, you've got winter creep, you've got Japanese honeysuckle, um, some others that I've been seeing more commonly, sweet autumn clematis and oriental bittersweet. Uh, there's no, you know, there's lots and lots of different vines. And then you've got your grasses and herbaceous species. So you've got um, miscanthus or Chinese silvergrass, you've got Japanese stilt grass or microstegium, 
uh, garlic mustard. This is a whole field of garlic mustard that's taken over Japanese knotweed and others. Um, so again, we could talk about invasive plants for a long time, but instead, let me just put a few new ones on your radar to look for in the future. So the first one I want to mention is Japanese chaff flower. So here's a photo of it. And there are some native species that look kind of similar. Um, but where I've seen it establishing, especially in riparian areas, like right along a river, um, it can just take over and form these really dense stands. Um, and it doesn't just stay there, so it can move up into upland areas as well. And it's been moving all along uh, kind of the Ohio River corridor uh, really rapidly. Um, so I think this is something to look for in the future. So here's where it is right now. You can see, and this has just happened in the past, uh, you know, 10 years or so. So I think it's got a lot of potential to spread out rapidly. So here's another photo. This is kind of what you might look for a little bit later this year, maybe in the fall. And you can see that you've got that dense stand of it, but you also have these spikes coming off of it. And those are where the seeds are located and it produces tons of seeds. And I'll show you a couple pictures of those. So this is what you might see right about now. This is the flowers that they make. They're not very distinctive, um, but you can see it's kind of has a little spike appearance. And um, if you look here, it's got these opposite leaves with these red internodes right where the leaves meet the stem there. But if we let this develop a little bit more, that flower is gonna make a spike. Um, and it's pretty distinctive and lots of seeds, high germination. And if we were to look really up close at some of those seeds, you'd see that they have these stiff little hairs on them that really easily get stuck into clothing or hair or equipment. And it's easy to spread them around rapidly. And I think they're also moving you know, right along the river there. So that's one Japanese chaff flower. Um, another one for you would be mile a minute weed. And here's just a photo of it. You can see it's got these very distinctive kind of triangular leaves and these berries right here uh, that turn color and they're, they're kind of pretty, but it will just take over. It's a vine, so it's gonna kind of carpet and grow over things. And it's got these very distinctive recurved uh, thorns on the side that make it a real pain to pull up. Um, so I don't know if you can tell from right here, but you've got these thorns that are recurved pointing kind of downward. Um, uh, and here's another picture of kind of an area that's been taken over with it. So similar to what you might see from some of your other vines. And another one for your area would be chocolate vine or kibia. Um, so it's got these very distinctive flowers, um, really attractive, and, and it's used as an ornamental plant uh, because of that. Um, but again, it's capable of really dominating and taking over, uh, forming these super dense uh, carpets that will grow on top of everything. So those are just a handful of new invasive plants to watch for. What about invasive insects and disease? And, and the reason why I wanna spend a little time on this is that again, if you were to see some of these things um, and catch them early, that's so much better than trying to play catch up after the fact. So we are never going to, you know, put him on Willie Adelgid uh, in a box and get rid of it. You know, that is too late for that. So now we're struggling to find other solutions. But for some of these, if it were to be detected, it could be locally kind of eradicated and um, we could manage it a lot better that way. So they're not here yet and I hope it stays that way. So I'm going to present on some things that we don't have um, in, in this area. Um, yet, or maybe uh, they're close by, but not quite here. So the first one I'm going to mention is sudden oak death, because I get a lot of questions about that. Um, I have a lot of people, especially right now, I've been seeing a lot of uh, decline in death of oak trees, particularly red oak trees. And it's not unusual for me to get an email that's like, I have sudden oak death. And your, your oak might have died suddenly, but sudden oak death uh, tends to refer to this one disease of oaks uh, that right now uh, is only present kind of on in California and Oregon along the coastal area. And you can see a picture here of everything that's dead there are um, tan oaks that have been killed by sudden oak death. But it's a really tricky disease because it's caused by an invasive pathogen that's got a, a name that's super hard to pronounce, Phytophthora remorum. Um, but this exact same pathogen will infect 
thousands of different host plants. So it is not a specialist. It is an extreme generalist. And the name sudden oak death refers to it when it's killing oak trees. But the vast majority of the time, so you know, you know oak trees is, causes these lethal trunk cankers will kill a tree. The vast majority of the time, it just causes a little bit of leaf blight. Uh, you'd never even notice it unless you were really looking for it. And when it's doing that, people tend to call it remorum blight. Um, but this is tricky from a regulatory perspective because it's very easy to accidentally move around and um, hard to control. So again, on most plants, just those leaf symptoms, you might get some tip dye back, you might get some needles, you might get some um, patches of dead spots. And as this picture indicates, you know, it's got a super broad host range. So um, everything from conifers to oaks to um, herbaceous species uh, are gonna be potential hosts for this disease, this pathogen. But the disease is gonna really vary. So this is on most plants. But again, on oaks and a few other species, it can be fatal. Um, so you can get these uh, trunk cankers that again are impacting the vascular system of that tree, cutting off the circulation of water. Um, and what you see is like a really sudden death of the tree. But actually that pathogen has been in that tree and has been um, hurting that tree for a little while. Uh, so, so just some background there. So why do we care about it for this area? What's the big deal? Um, here's a map of suitability to sudden oak death and how high is the risk? Well, I don't like what's going on in this area, right? This is a high risk area all through Appalachians um, for sudden oak death. And how they developed this was a mix of suitable hosts as well as the weather and the humidity. So we've got, sudden oak death likes really wet, humid conditions. Uh, and we certainly have some of those. Um, and the other issue here being that here's where it is right now on the West Coast and it is repeatedly introduced to other parts of the country accidentally through the nursery trade. So uh, last year we had um, a nursery that was accidentally shipping around contaminated plants. Again, it's really hard, you know, it's easy to criticize that and to point to that nursery, but um, this is a really tricky disease. And, they weren't shipping around contaminated oaks. They were shipping around other plants that happened to have it on it. Uh, so this is kind of a situation where after the fact, they realized this was happening. They tried to track down those plants and they found out that they had you know, sold them in many of our neighboring states, uh, not Kentucky. It has not been confirmed that any uh, diseased plants were sold in Kentucky, but certainly in our neighbors of Illinois, um, as well as other parts uh, of the region. Um, but I really like this article that was like, yes, it's been found, but don't panic yet, because it hasn't established in the landscape. It um, you know, just was being shipped around in those nursery plants. So uh, to the best of our knowledge, it's not established. It's not around. Um, and who knows, maybe our environment is not going to support it living there. I hope so. I hope that, you know, there's something about our environment it just doesn't like and it's not going to arrive and it's not going to kill our trees. Um, when they tested our same species in the western United States, they did find that they were killed by this pathogen. Um, but hopefully there's something really different about our environment uh, that, that makes it not conducive to this. Um, so another invasive I want to mention is a spotted lanternfly. If you haven't heard about uh, this insect, you probably will soon. So it's really uh, eye-catching, you know, pretty as far as a, a fly can be pretty. It's got these polka dots on it. And um, here it is on its favorite host of all times. It's thought to need it for its life cycle. And I've actually already mentioned it today. So I don't know if you have any guesses about what it is, but this is Tree of Heaven, an invasive plant. And if it stayed on Tree of Heaven, I'd be delighted. We would have a biological control for Tree of Heaven. It'd be great. But unfortunately, it does not stay on Tree of Heaven. Uh, it feeds on basically everything. So all of our um, deciduous species, our hardwood species, you know, maples, oaks, um, you name it, it'll feed on those. It also feeds on pine trees, on fruit trees, on orchard crops. Um, it's got a really broad uh, range of different plants that it will feed on. 
And here's what it looks like in different phases of its life. So it lays eggs and then covers them with this waxy substance. And you can see they can be really hard to see. So this is a close-up view of them and they're kind of covered with something. Um, the other big challenge is that they will lay eggs on just about anything. So here's a um, you know, metal barrel where eggs have been laid on. Um, they will lay eggs on equipment, on vehicles. Um, easy to accidentally move them around. So when those eggs hatch, they'll hatch into little nymphs, um, black and white polka dotted. And that looks different from the picture I showed you at the beginning. Um, that's because it's gonna go through a couple different phases. So um, at first these nymphs are gonna look like this. Um, you know, still, still pretty, pretty neat looking. Um, uh, then they'll go through another stage where they're kind of this red, black and white polka dots. And finally, they'll, uh, you know, become adults. And most of the time, you know, if, if you spread their wings out, they look like this. But most of the time they don't. They look like this. Um, and what they're doing is um, sucking the sap out of those trees. Now, the problem is not that they're there, not that they're doing it, but that they do this in huge numbers. So here's a couple photos of, you know, some trees that had spotted lantern fly on them, and they're just completely covered with them. Uh, so what does this mean for our forest? I don't really know. Um, where it's been introduced so far, it's really been more of a problem in landscape settings and for orchards for kind of uh, grape, orchard, uh, grape growers and different types of orchard uh, trees. Um, that's where people have been most concerned. I honestly don't know what it means in our woodland settings. Um, and I think that's still kind of up for, up for debate. Um, but here's where it is right now. Uh, you can see it's very, very recent arrival uh, here. Um, but uh, right in the heart of, of its distribution is in Pennsylvania, uh, New Jersey, uh, Delaware, but also moving into Maryland, West Virginia, Virginia, uh, even, even one found here in North Carolina, although not an infestation. Um, so this is the kind of thing that I think it could really move uh, m pretty fast. So I just want to mention a couple more, and this is kind of a, a positive story. So gypsy moth. Um, so gypsy moth is something that has been at our doorstep for a long time. Here are, is the gypsy moth caterpillar. And uh, the reason why gypsy moth is a problem is that it will eat leaves of trees, especially oak trees, um, but it will eat all of the leaves. <laughs> it will defoliate these trees, you know, eat all of their leaves year after year after year. We have some native insects that can kind of do something similar. You know, they can eat a lot of leaves, but they don't do it year after year after year. Um, that can really stress trees out. And what they found is that in areas where gypsy moth has arrived, the health of those woodlands, the quality of those oak trees um, really nosedives and, you know, really impacts long term what happens in those areas. So. I would like to keep gypsy moth as far away from us for as long as possible because gypsy moth's been here for a long time and the nice thing about that is the longer that it's here the more diseases that it picks up the more uh, kind of problems that it has to face that maybe will make it less of um, kind of less damaging to our trees. So I would like to hold gypsy moth as long as we can. Here's a map of where it currently is. And you can see, you know, we're, we're right there. It's very close to us. But this has kind of held this front for a long time. And I want to raise this up as a success story because the reason why that's been the case is this slow the spread program. And what you can see here is kind of a map of what they're doing with that program. So they've got these different zones. And by they, I mean, this is a collaboration with the federal government and then all of these different states. And what they're doing is they are um, right along that front, right along that front where gypsy moth is moving. Uh, they are trapping for it. They're trying to eradicate any big jumps that have been made. So they're just trying to make sure that it just moves super, super slowly. Um, and they've been incredibly successful with that. Um, there have been estimates that for every dollar spent on that program, there are $4 saved uh, 
just in quarantine costs alone in the forest industries that they don't have to deal with that. Um, not even taking into account, you know, all of the kind of harder to calculate benefits of the impact that this is ha could have on our woodlands. Um, so here's some photos. If you see these traps, these little triangular traps and trees, that's what this is. They're trying to monitor for this. If they find it, they're going to try to eradicate it locally so that it doesn't spread any faster than it's already going to. Uh, keep that spread super, super slow because uh, one big advantage with this gypsy moth compared to some of the other things I talked about is that the females are flightless. They can't fly. So if they can't fly, if we don't move them around, they're going to fly, they're, they're going to move as fast as those caterpillars can get around, basically, which is not very fast. Um, so I think that that's a huge, um, you know, a huge example of what can be done with some of these things. And here's a projection. You know, this is where we're likely to be with gypsy moth um, in 2045, you know, just barely reaching our area. Uh, whereas if we didn't have this program, it's estimated that by then it would be all the way through this whole region, more or less. Um, so I think that's a, that's a pretty cool program and I like to share that with people. But I also like to share that every year we do get positives for gypsy moth in the state. So even though it seems like it's been there forever and it's never, you know, arrived, um, it's a constant threat. So one more to, you know, just really make sure our brain is full for tonight. Um, this is Asian longhorn beetle. Uh, the reason I had to throw this in there is that it was just detected in South Carolina, and it's also present a little pocket of it in uh, southern Ohio. So it's an Asian insect, and um, you can see it's quite huge. It's like the size of my thumb. That hole there is the size of a dime, and they really prefer maple trees. They will tunnel through maple trees. Um, you can imagine that a maple tree riddled with holes that big is going to die and going to fall apart really rapidly. Um, so a huge issue. Fortunately, these are another insect that's not going to move super fast unless we move it around. Um, so whenever it's detected, the USDA tries to contain it and eradicate it, and they have been successful on several occasions. Um, so that's another case why if you see something, report it to your county extension agent or your forester um, so that they can determine whether or not uh, this is maybe no big deal or, or something that really needs to be addressed. So here's kind of the risk map for Asian longhorn beetle. Uh, in our areas, maples are key. And here's a map of where it is right now. So it's, it's in little tiny pockets um, where it's been accidentally introduced with packaging material from Asia. Um, but so far it's contained. And um, the, there are several sites where it's been successfully eradicated, which is another huge success story. So before I wrap up, I wanna mention a couple other issues. So these are things like yellow poplar weevil that you might see pop up every year on yellow poplar. This is a native issue. So it might look terrible and your, your poplars might be looking like they're, you know, their, their leaves might be all brown. Um, but this is a native insect um, and it can stress trees and there might be some occasions where you really do see tree, tree stress. Um, but in general, it's not going to have the kind of impact of everything else that I just talked about. Um, because this, our trees, they're adapted to this. They've dealt with yellow poplar uh, weevil for, for many, many years. And it's unlikely to really hurt those trees. The same would be true for something like scarlet oak sawfly. So here you can see in this picture some oak trees. Um, you can see it looks like they're dying. Maybe they have sudden oak death, right? Um, you might get email, like uh, the, my, tr my trees are suddenly dying. Um, but looking at those trees up close, looking at those leaves up close, what you can actually see are, are all of these little sawflies that are turning the leaves brown because they're eating them. Um, and it can look really bad, but again, unlikely to permanently hurt those trees. Another issue I've been seeing a lot of lately is white pine decline. Um, now this can come in a couple different uh, forms and there can be many different things driving this. Um, in this case, in this photo that you can see here, this was a white pine stand that was planted as a plantation and with the intention of going through and thinning it at some fine point. Unfortunately, that thinning never happened and what they're left with are really, really, really dense white pine um, that just can't grow as well as they normally would because they're all packed in there. Uh, I've also seen a lot of white pine declining 
just I think due to some of our weather conditions these past years. And I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more. So, wow, last summer we had quite a drought. And this is a map from October in 2019. Um, and it's just one of the most extreme, the most extreme drought we've ever had. Um, our native trees are, are really well adapted to our environment and they can deal with a lot, but this could certainly be a, a very significant stress on trees. So if you had trees that were already stressed, this could be the nail in the coffin. If you had trees that were doing okay, this could be a stress that could really kind of um, send them into a downward spiral. So most of our trees are gonna be just fine, but if you were walking around the woods or even kind of in your landscape uh, in your neighborhood, you might have seen a lot of signs of drought. This was around October last year. Um, you know, trees just looking uh, really, really um, bad. And I've never seen that before in the forest setting. You know, it looks like fall leaf color, but it's not. It's not time for it. That would, that's the drought. Um, so. Another kind of, in addition to those stresses from the drought that I mentioned, um, we had really wet weather in the fall after that drought, followed by sudden cold temperatures. So trees, uh, this, this is a, a red maple um, that had its leaves on way, way past when it should have because there was a cold snap that froze everything. The trees didn't drop their leaves like they should have. Um, and the problem with that is that there's damage to those trees, uh, to their bark, to those um, stems because of that. So you can get um, a perfect avenue for decay to start, um, for future uh, cracks in trunks or branches. So again, another stress, right? It's, it's our weather, but it, this is something that is an unusual thing for trees to have to cope with. And then as if that weren't enough, this past spring, we had two really unusual kind of late frosts after the weather had been quite warm. So many trees lost newly emerging leaves, not once, but twice. Uh, so here in this photo, this is pawpaw and yellow poplar. Um, you know, those leaves got fried uh, once and then just as they were starting to put out new leaves, uh, they got um, uh, killed again by that cold. Um, this is something that most trees are gonna recover from just fine but another stressor. And one thing that I do think is very important is that a lot of the, the buds were killed in those frosts. So I would expect this to be a super low year for fruit and for mast um, for many species. So certainly pawpaw, you know, that hit right when a lot of those trees were flowering. So I think we're gonna have really, really low production of pawpaw, but also things like acorns. Um, years like this historically have had very low acorn production. Uh, so I think that, that could have impacts for wildlife as well. So just something to consider. Um, so with that, I just wanna kind of list some forest health resources. You know, obviously your county extension agents are the best uh, resource for connecting you to information and to other resources to follow up with. Um, the plant diagnostic lab, if it's needed, to extension specialists like myself. And I wanted to just kind of give a quick pitch for our weekly From the Woods Today uh, show that we do Wednesdays at 11 Eastern, talking all sorts of different uh, uh, forestry and natural resources and wildlife issues. Also, your state division of forestry and service foresters. Um, so I've got a picture here of Alexander Blevin, who's our uh, Kentucky uh, Division of Forestry Forest Health Specialist, um, and she does a lot of site visits and come, come visit your property and um, try to figure out what's going on there. Uh, there's also fantastic consulting foresters, technical service providers, um, so if you've got a lot of invasive species and you want to do something about it, um, these are some, some great resources for, for doing that. And then you have uh, NRCS, the Natural Resource Conservation Service, and they have cost share opportunities, funding opportunities to actually support some of that. Um, and we've got a brand new app, Healthy Woods. Um, if you want to give it a spin, try it out, um, healthywoods.org, uh, healthywoodsapp.org. And um, if you download it, it'll kind of walk you through how do you assess the health of your woodlands and then spit out um, when you're done a report for you that kind of walks through based on you know, what you recorded, what's going on in your woods? Uh, is your woodland doing well or are there some major issues?
that then you can share with foresters, with your county agent, with others to kind of use as a starting place for next steps in management. Um, so with that, I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing. I um, know I'm, I'm right at seven o'clock. So uh, I don't know if I have time for questions, but if you have any, I'll be happy to take them. And uh, thanks for having me today. Sure, if there's any questions, go ahead and type them in the chat or uh, unmute or whatever. Great information, Ellen, thank you. Oh, well, like I said, uh, I, can, I can talk a little too much sometimes. So my apologies there. <laughs> no problem. No problem. Great information. Good stuff. A lot of great information. I got Ellen, I have a question. Yes, the definitely. spotted lan lantern fly, did you say it is in our region or it's just close Well, by? it's been detected in uh, West Virginia and Virginia, but not your part of Virginia. So not kind of, you know, in that let me let me pull up that map again. I can show you where it is. Um, Could you pull up a, a picture of the adult? Mm -hmm. Yeah, let me do that. Hold on. So, so I saw something one. like that the other day that looked awful. No, so that's, that's not the, the adult. adult there, is it? That is, that's the adult. Um, that's what it looks like. And it's a true fly, even though sometimes you'll see pictures like, hold on, let me show you this one. It kind of makes it look like it's a moth or something. No, it's a fly. It's got those sucking mouth parts. Um, and it looks a little less distinctive when it's on the tree, except for that there's just so many of them. And so one thing I would say about this one, so here's a map of where it is right now. So you can see it's in Virginia, but the far northern part of Virginia. Um, so one thing to look for with spotted lanternfly is it is thought to need tree of heaven for its life cycle. So it can't get by without tree of heaven. So if you've got a lot of tree of heaven, um, it could be, you know, that's, that's a place to look for it. Um, I'm trying to encourage people to get rid of all of their tree of heaven. And uh, I don't care if that means you can't scout for spotted lanternfly anymore. I, it would be better not to have tree of heaven. So, <laughs> yeah. Tree of heaven looks a lot like walnut tree, doesn't it? It does. It does look a lot like walnut tree. It's got a, um, a distinctive smell that is not uh, the smell of walnut. Um, that that might be might be a useful. And and the you know the the fruit and that they make is going to be really different. It's also them. got this little um, tooth right at the base of each leaflet. So they both have these compound leaves. So lots of little leaflets on each one. It makes it, you know, the, each individual leaf is actually huge and it's got all these little leaflets on it. But if you look at Tree of Heaven, they've got like one little tooth at the base of each leaflet. And um, if you look on the underside, there's kind of like a gland, like a little dot right there. Yeah, I think I saw some the other day in the National it's Forest. It's flowering right now. It's uh, so it's really like now's a good time to look for it because the flowers, you know, they're they're just distinctive. And if you see that, yeah, I confuse it with walnut a lot when I'm driving by. I'm like, is that tree of heaven? Or you know, going you're doing my 60 miles per hour botany. Yeah. Um, like is that tree of heaven or is that walnut? Um, but right now you can't. If it's tree of heaven, you'll know because the, the flowers uh, are are different. That lant lantern fly, I saw a moth the other day here at my house that looks almost like that. The, the gray appearance, but the marks on it look more like water marks. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. like a circle. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I guess it's something else. I'm happy to say I think it's something else. Yes, <laughs> one, one thing we don't have to deal with yet. <laughs> I took a picture of it. Do you want a picture? But, uh, well, hey, if you got a picture, um, you know, you can share it with me. And have you heard of this app, iNaturalist? Have you tried it out? No. This is, this is going to be the best thing I'm going to tell you tonight. I just talked your ear off for a whole hour, and this is the thing. So there's this free app, and I, I, they don't pay me, but they should, because I tell everyone about them. But it's called iNaturalist, like iPhone, but iNaturalist. And... Um, it is just too cool. You can take a picture of something and it'll basically identify it for you. Now it's not always right. Oh yeah, you got it right there. Yeah, <laughs> but it's pretty good. And when it comes to insects, it's really good. And it's a really good starting place. And even if the app gets it wrong, 
there's like hundreds of thousands of people who use this app all the time and um, they just go through and try to correct your wrong identification so you'll get an email from someone that's like oh i don't actually think that this was this insect i think it was that one and it works for insects for plants um it's, it's just really handy jeremy you use it do you like it it's it's really good uh what i'll typically do is i cross-reference though uh, yes <laughs> it's one of those things of is it really that and so i'll use it and and mm -hmm. sometimes it'll throw you a curveball and you've got a cross-reference i've I've noticed that on a few things uh, yeah pretty and good, i'd say pretty handy it, yeah it's pretty handy it's just a great like resource yeah don't don't use it as the end-all be-all right. um but it's so handy when you're out in the woods if you've got signal if you're out in the woods, you're just like, oh, wow, huh, neat. I've got my own little tour guide. Um, terrible for mushrooms. Don't even, you know, it's not good for mushrooms, but great for plants and insects. I have tried it on mushrooms. <laughs> and had to cross I, hope, <laughs> I hope you, I hope you had more them. luck than I had. <laughs> I had to cross-reference. Yeah. <laughs> good, good question. Good question. Any other questions? If none, uh, Ellen, thank you so much. We really appreciate oh, you coming out here on, on a Tuesday evening uh, and, and joining us and uh, uh, great information this evening uh, on Woodland Health. And I know we, we all uh, gather a lot of information here and we, we definitely appreciate you coming out. So. Well, I appreciate all of you all uh, being here and caring about your woods. And thanks again uh, for having me join tonight. Well, thank you for uh, being with us. Uh, well, folks, I tell you what, um, next week uh, we have a really uh, uh, another great uh, lineup. We've got uh, uh, on Tuesday night, we've got uh, Nuisance Wildlife and uh, Dr. Matt Springer from the University of Kentucky is going to be with us. And uh, then on Thursday night, I know Phil has got a segment. Uh, he's lined up with somebody there in Wise County concerning fishing, fly fishing, maybe some tips, tactics, that sort of thing. So that's what the more outdoor things uh, going on next week. So next Tuesday and Thursday. So uh, look forward to having everybody back then. And so uh, Ellen has listed her, uh, her email down here. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to contact her at e.crocker, that's C-R-O-C-K-E-R, e.crocker at uky.edu. Awesome. Uh, Ellen, thank you so much. Everybody have a great evening and we will see you all next week.